Action. Action. Hi, Ali. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I'm pretty good. A little nervous, but very relaxed. Somehow so, still. Okay, okay, okay. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having yes. me. Let me present you uh, Ali Leon or uh, Ali Lepage. We, we were still... Uh, I'm still f figuring, that figuring out. it out, but uh, yeah, Ali, I know you, how do I know you from a little bit from partying? I think yeah. I remember, I think the first time I saw you was after the one, like there was only one, I think like a black lives matters, uh, like yes. the big, uh, protest during yes. the COVID lockdowns at, uh, at Place Poulart. Yes. And Twenty thousand people actually. That yeah, was a lot. yeah, that was like that left a big uh, impression on me. Really, mm -hmm. like I was, uh, yeah, moved. I was a bit disappointed that there were not more, more that followed after that. But like, yeah. well, I'm sure there are more protests, of course. Mm -hmm. Like the scale of this and the uh, it was a uh, was a good vibe there. But I remember that after after that protest, I think we hung out at the same park or something, and then mm -hmm. and then there was this thing also with Carlos. Yes, at uh, the Fuse Open Air in a Touraine Taxi. Also during the lockdowns. And, yeah. uh, and that's a funny story, actually, I think. Yes, <laughs> that was the start of everything, yeah. actually. It's true. That is when you... you yeah, that was a, a big shift in, in my career, actually. Well, I remember I was going to go to the Fuse Open Air with mm -hmm. Kagos, a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And who who also uh, wants to like he's very interested in video and photography and stuff. And then you gave me a call, I think, uh, yes. saying that you were you pitched to this project video yes. reportage of uh, the underground or like behind the scenes a bit. I don't know what was what it? Was it? <laughs> it was uh, I yeah, it was something about uh, because remember back then uh, with COVID we couldn't really travel, yeah. so it's all about staycation. Right. And so I remember I had pitched this idea of um, doing some kind of a series about what there is actually still to do in Brussels uh -huh. at that time that summer, and I pitched that to. Bruz, mm -hmm. actually the uh, Flemish uh, Brussels media radio, company yeah. media that do company, yeah. that do they do radio magazine yeah. and also yeah, TV, true. and uh, they loved the idea, and uh, they offered me to go do a test, and right. I did. You called me. I called you. And I was like, "Hey, <laughs> let's just do this all yes. together." And then we totally bluffed ourselves into, into the every backstage and having inter interviews True. with all the artists. True, <laughs> is here. Yeah, that was so good. You were like your confidence was like. <clears throat> oh, I was sorry, nervous. top notch. Yeah, I was, was nervous. Thank God you were there because uh, I had fun. I had big time like imposter syndrome, uh, yeah. which was pretty valid since I pretty much was an imposter back then. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what I was doing at all, but I learned a lot and. Uh, Yes, that was a big, uh, that was a defining moment. For yeah, me. I was impressed with how you like, you, you took that in hands and like, and we actually did something and we did yeah. it and I think it got you further too. It was like a pilot of yeah. something like. Well, it got me a job. Yeah, right. <laughs> Became a video journalist. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, maybe uh, if you can explain a little bit. Uh, who you are and what you do, like how, how, how can we know you? Like I know you, but, uh, yeah. and I know you do um, lots of amazing stuff with, uh, you've done, you've worked for Bruce, you've worked for Vice, you've worked for Fuse, Seduce, Paradise City. Do I need to say more <laughs> impressive things, you know? Like... The list is pretty long, but then it would sound, start sounding obnoxious. And you're still, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but you're still so young too. So it's like, I'm um... like... I'm a year away from 30. Wow, well, okay. Well, still young, so exactly, young, I'm going to repeat. Still very young. Yes, so thank so you. you had like, I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing you go places. So, But like yeah. for now, where is like, who is Ali Lepage, uh, Leon? So, um, who's Ali? Who is Ali? Um, Ali is uh, this young woman who lives in Brussels. 
but who spent her teenage years in uh, Provence Luxembourg, okay. which is the south, the southest point of Belgium that there is. Um, little town uh, with a with the kind of parents that were not really letting her out much. And so I basically grew up on YouTube, mm. uh, just watching a bunch of videos, uh, whether that was the Vice documentaries or makeup videos or a lot of music videos as well. And, uh, you know, dreaming my time away mm-hmm. um, of another life until I was old enough to... Move to the big city of Brussels again because back the back there it looks like a huge city. Yeah, well, it's um, the biggest, it's the most proper city I think in Belgium. True. Like sorry, true. Antwerp and every other city yeah. in Belgium. Like, like big Brussels towns. is like <laughs> yeah, it's the capital of Europe. So I guess exactly. And so when I was um, eighteen, I uh, I wasn't yet believing I could do any of this, so I did. Um, business management, um, and then I did translation because I happen to be pretty good at languages. Um, and then at some point, how did it all start? It oh yeah, it started uh, with me failing all of my German classes mm. and having to uh, reset my year, not being allowed on Erasmus. And so I had decided that if I stayed another year in Brussels just doing German, I would be depressed. So I decided to go to Berlin, okay. uh, take some German classes. Obviously, I only went to 30% of them and I spent the rest of my time partying. <laughs> when in Berlin. <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, I remember one uh, glorious morning coming home at sunrise making that decision that what I wanted to do was work in events and organize parties and create times and spaces with awesome music and awesome people in great locations uh, to have a good time. That was going to be my life mission. Mm-hmm. I had already dreamt about it a lot when I was a teenager, but I had never really witnessed it, witnessed it firsthand. Um, so Berlin really was a huge shift in perspective for me. So went home, aced all my German classes. Did you work in Berlin too, or like? Did I you... gave some French and English classes to okay. some girl, but but not in like uh, the club scene. No, or I was really like... just like okay. discovering the music. Like I didn't know, I didn't I didn't even know anything about electronic music before I was. 22 mm. something like that i was really way more into pop hip-hop r&b soul and funk music way before that um and uh yeah came back and um managed to get on on my erasmus and there actually it was a pretty uh big university is the university of warwick mm. if i'm pronouncing this fancy. right fancy pretty fancy um and that's where i learned the value of work because i was i used to slack a little bit i used to slack a little bit i was a bit lazy a bit caught up with boys and Mm. you know it's like being a teenager too. exactly i was still a teenager um and then got back and um i somehow got to know this uh artistic director slash dj slash stenographer was working on a bunch of projects, like too many. It was He was actually this guy from Paris living in Brussels. Um, and through him, I worked on this. The first big project or pretty big project I worked on is called Loop Sessions, uh, which was a which is a beat making event uh, that started off in uh, Montreal and then uh, got picked up in different cities. Um, London, Paris, um, several cities in Brazil as well, Vancouver. Um, and when I arrived in this little world, they had just started off in Brussels as well. Okay. And those were taking place in Sidus. And that was like the very beginning of Sidus. Like I think that opened like since three months, mm. four months max. Okay, okay. And um, um, 
there was this girl, Sophia, like I will forever call her my fairy. Um, she had this brilliant idea of asking the one of the founders of C12, of Sidus, to if they needed an intern. And they were like, oh, well, who? And she said me. And they were like, oh, yeah, she, she, she's hard working. She does her best. Uh, yeah, sure, send your CV. And um, a week later, I had a meeting with a different founder. I didn't really understand what was happening. I was like, that's not the guy I spoke to. And this one happened to be the artistic director, Tom Bru. And uh, he said, I want you on the artist care team. And that's how it all started. How old okay. was I? 20. Was I 23? I think I was 23. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And, and I didn't know anything about this world. I even asked them like, hey guys, I, I just <laughs> discovered techno. Like I know nothing about it. Like you don't you mind? And they're like, no, we just really need someone who's very good with people. And you're good at this. We know mm, it. Yeah. And uh, over time took more and more responsibility um basically became the right hand of the artistic director slash booker on on the booking side of things and um and yeah it was a, a hell of a ride like my whole world shifted started discovering a lot of new things met a lot of huge people in the beginning i actually never looked up anyone beforehand mm -hmm. just because i wanted to stay how should i put it unbiased mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not have any expectations about who i was hosting like i wanted to keep on treating everyone like a normal human it being it shouldn't make a difference in the end i guess exactly you know, like... exactly and i remember i did it once looked someone up beforehand and it really got me nervous oh, yeah uh, i think it was ben clock or something okay. i was like and then 900,000 followers on Facebook. Like, my brain was like, oh. Uh, <sighs> First time, last time. <laughs> um, and yeah, I did that for a long time. Then eventually, obviously, seeing the same four walls every weekend, every week of the year, I was kind of like, ah. <sighs> I need something else. Plus, there was a lot of pressure as well because I went from nobody to somebody overnight. Yeah, very young. You know, like 23. And, uh, exactly. Like, I was surrounded by all these club kids who literally grew up in clubs in Brussels and knew mm. everything about everything. And they were super cool. And I was kind of shy and um, very intimidated as well by all these big personalities. And I think I also had to, like, grow up, my, grow mine up a little bit just to make a make a fighting chance mm. at not being like um how should I put it um bulldozed by everyone mm -hmm. um and yeah then after this things went very quickly I just happened to get to know uh, uh, a girl who eventually became editor-in-chief advice and um I, I I was looking for another internship for school as well because in the meantime, I had uh, started studying corporate communication and marketing for my master's because I did feel like this can be it. Mm. Like I do need something to rely on for if in 10 years I'm going to be too old or too tired of doing this. Um, so I need an internship and I didn't really like marketing, mm. but it was the closest Thing that I could directly do after having done my bachelor in translation. Um, and um, one day I asked her, hey, do you know anyone who's looking for an intern? And she said, yes, I do. And so I applied and they took me mm -hmm. and I did that. And then COVID hit. And so my whole sector was um, completely closed off. Actually, everything closed off a month after I became a freelancer. Because I had a... Right, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had just signed the papers to become a freelancer. I was like, I'm going to do this. I met a lot of people. I was going to go to Portugal and New York and everything. And everything shut down. Uh -huh. And so um, I was like, okay, well, if I do nothing, I'm going to be depressed. 
So what am I doing? And I figured, well, I've had I have this little experience in journalism. I've even when I was younger, I did write a little bit here and there, just you know, like writing my feelings out. Or I did pretty well in school as well, um, like writing texts. And so um, I continued doing that. Obviously, I wasn't the best. Um, I really had still a lot to learn. Um, and um, I'm glad that um, my editor in chief back in the days, she really encouraged me to continue writing, but also for other media outlets, just to have different experiences, have different so, points of views. Yeah. Um, and that's how, um, at some point, when I pitched her the idea to do this a series about a staycation, what is there to do in Brussels during COVID? And she said, no, mm. I remember what she had told me before. And so I went to Bruges. Yeah. And they liked it. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. So uh, but it's one of the nicest things too, I think, if you can come up with a concept and then and just sell that for like somebody that's, or another company that sees value in it. Yeah. And, like, it's, so, uh, sometimes when you knock at one door and the answer is no, you just knocked at the wrong door and just try the next one. Really, sometimes it's that simple. And uh, and so, yeah, um, then we had this whole try out together with Carlos yeah. and you really helped me. And you, I remember you even taught me how to edit on the, yeah. that was Premiere Rush. Maybe we should like, yeah, do the, so we did end up making a pilot episode yeah. for an online uh, reportage uh, about yeah, yeah about, about uh, the Fuse Open Air and uh, we we had a quick interviews. interview of the artist and who else did we interview? <sighs> so long ago yeah, huh? I remember uh, oh, man, uh, oh, Ben, yeah, we ben all... Nidrev yeah Ben Nidrev and, and um, one of them became my buddies also for uh, ah uh, was it Chris Ferreira? yes Chris, Chris Ferreira, Ferreira. Uh, yeah. I was yes. telling you I'm always bad with them. Amazing too, DJ, but like, yeah, Chris, I'm like, I we I hung out with them a bunch of times yeah, after. And it was, I remember uh, that. That was really cool. And also some visitors as well. And uh, and so, yeah, then after that, they gave me a shot. Um, and so I remember uh, first day, um, my, that other edit, that my new editor-in-chief, uh, his name was Rohan, mm -hmm. this guy from Antwerp. And uh, he was like, he was not feeling me. No. Like, no, he was no like click. the incarnation of <laughs> your nemesis being a greatest teacher. Uh, you know, like I really <laughs> had to um, suck it up mm. and uh, prove myself. And it was good because he did teach me a lot, like mm. a lot. And um, I remember my first mission for them was going to the... Um, park near Tervuren um, about some neighbors complaining that a, that a tree got cut off. That was my story of the day. <laughs> yeah. That was my story of the day. And so like I had to take the, um, um, how do you call it in English? Entrepied? Statif? Uh, statif, yeah. Yeah. With the camera and the bike. Like for 40 minutes, tripod. all the way there, the yeah. tripod, there you go. Yeah. I was on the bike for 40 minutes with all this heavy gear. And I was like, I hate this. And you had to do this all by yourself? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, yeah. That just threw me right in there. But that's what I'm saying. Like you have, when you have a vision of like doing this thing where you're like, you're comfortable being around the people and like, you know, the, and then you have to do some story about a tree that's going to be cut off and then exactly. everybody's upset, you know? Like, well, of course it's like still valuable but like uh, no, it was, so it's kind of a clash I guess it was COVID there was literally <laughs> nothing to speak about so but anyways um, yeah, there was no nightlife exactly <laughs> but it was okay because it was a humbling experience and it did motivate me to come up with better stories to tell and I was lucky indeed that I knew enough people uh, from back in the days that I did come up with some cool stuff you know, um, and they did give me a check. They, they did always trust me in the stories I brought. Um, it They taught me how to script a story, how to direct, how to film, how to edit, um, how to kill my darling. That was uh, 
uh, one of the greatest lessons as well. Like when mm. you create something, you have to be able to look at it objectively and yeah. just kill it. Just break it down and go go to the essential. And it's usually better. Yeah. It's a very intense and visceral experience, but it was good. It's a real world experience too. And that's, exactly. Uh, like more valuable even, I think, than if you would have went to school uh, and did a, did a course uh, mm -hmm. in like video production or something like the experience that you had there or in journalism. I think mm -hmm. like I think you can learn a lot in those places. But then from my experience coming out of both film school and photography school, it's like you come out and then like and then you have to start learning because then there's a real world, you know, like mm -hmm. there's no teachers that you can like kind of figure them out too after a while you know like you know this one likes this and this one likes this and this is how i have to get it done you know mm -hmm. like this is how i have to get a passing grade in the end also mm -hmm. you know like it's kind of like it's all assignments but then in the real world you have to yeah you, you gotta find for a place it. and you have to it's make serious. something that's valuable to like other people other other businesses so yeah like and also uh, you know like this thing in the real world it actually gets online yeah you know it's not it's yeah. not for jokes anymore and it's also not for no. free it's not for a grade so uh it's uh yeah i had to i had to fight off uh, imposter syndrome a lot i did a lot of uh, extra hours uh at home you know like how do i do this what is this called like i spent so many hours on youtube so many hours yeah. just like learning like continuously learning extra stuff that i didn't learn in school since i studied something else mm. but i did have to know since apparently this is my job now yeah <laughs> um and so yeah then um what was also funny thing about life is that after six months doing uh, working with uh, bros I did get a little tired of it because it was COVID. That was the only thing we were talking about all the time. And it was really like taking a toll on my mental health. And I was so ready to leave. Mm. And one day I got a call from my editor-in-chief advice again. And she had seen some of the videos I'd shared. And she said, hey, do you want to edit uh, this video for us? Mm. The, the first video I did for them was Diverse Ideas. It was about um, Muslim feminist women. Uh, that was incredible. That was really, yeah. really nice. I it also sounds like a really interesting. It's super interesting topic. Subject, so. Again, kind of knew what I was doing. Kind of had to spend a lot of hours on YouTube figuring out some new stuff. Yeah. I spent a lot of hours in the office until 4 a.m. Like ordering your rates, not leaving until it was done. Mm. Um. Then you were editing video uh, or like stuff that someone else. Yes. Photographed. You were the editor of the video. Exactly. Okay. Uh, nice. <laughs> yes. Very nice. After having learned how to do any of this like but six yeah, months exactly, ago. <laughs> you know, like I like even sometimes me when like I really like to edit my own stuff, but like I never really see myself as an editor, you know, mm. like it's like uh like I wouldn't, I wouldn't go look for just editing jobs, which, because also like, I don't know, it's, uh, it's different, but like that you can do that, like that you did, yeah, that you did this is awesome. I yeah, think. yeah. And it was great. really, <laughs> it was really nice. And it, it was a really good video and it worked really well. Obviously, um, uh, my coworker like helped me out a lot as well and like mm. did the finishing touches, but, um, yeah, it was, it was truly inspiring and it was really a, a changing moment for me in a sense of, how should I put it? Like this little girl who grew up in the middle of nowhere is still there in me. Mm. I still remember being her. I still remember. And how was, how was that in the, like in that small time? Cause I, I can kind of, yeah, see a, a paint a little vague, like I know there's not a lot happening. Out well, there's there. it's nothing like... happening. There's maybe one, uh, how, how do they call them? Un bal? 
like a ball yeah, yeah, yeah. once uh, every yeah, like two months or so, so. <laughs> yes it's <laughs> like it would be like uh the the kids who were like in last year of high school who would organize right. a party to to make some money to go on their um end of studies trip if you mm, want yeah. that was basically the only thing like the boy scouts uh yeah but party yeah, or something exactly something like, equivalent yeah. to that yeah. um also didn't have that many friends like uh, cuz i arrived there i was 9 hmm. uh cuz i was born in brussels my parents moved to luxembourg for work so i arrived there i was 9 i didn't speak french yet i was still speaking dutch Oof. only um it took up to how long did it take me to actually make friends? I think I was like 14 or something. Um, and my friends were actually two years older than me. So after two years, they left for university. Mm. So last two years, I have I had one friend. Um, but that was really it. Like, I was... I was... Bit of a... Bit of a weirdo. Bit of an outcast. Mm. I was quite bullied for the first couple of years of high school. Mm. Like, pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, it got me very... I was already very insecure, like, since day one. Yeah. Uh, I had acne. People were making fun of me. I was the only black kid in all school. You know, my brother was the only other one. But he was, like, four years younger than me. He was mm. also getting a lot of shit. Um, and... Uh, and so, yeah, like going from this girl no one wants to hang out with, that everyone makes fun of, that's super insecure, that actually like um, never really felt seen or loved or whatever. Going from that girl to what? Not even 10 years later, being the video editor of uh, Vice Belgium. I, I I swear I think you're one of the most popular people that I <laughs> that I know in my friend group. You know, like you go to a party with you and every like, there's always someone you know or like or you know the bouncer or you know the person checking the tickets. It's like VIP service. With you're going out. You know, like <laughs> it is a big contrast. Yeah, it's it is like, a huge man, contrast. Like, it is. Oh, that's so like shit to hear. You know, like yeah, and it's funny because like. Obviously, nobody knows that about me because no one, nobody grew up there with me. Like, everybody got to know me in my 20s. And, um, but yeah, I, um, I think it's also good that this girl is still there in me because I feel like it keeps my, my feet on the ground and my head on my shoulders. Um, because... Yes, now I go out. Sometimes I do get like, not bothered, but when someone comes up to you and they're like, oh my God, uh, you're so beautiful. Or, oh my God, your job is so cool. And uh, I always have like this slight distance to it because I remember, I still remember what it was like when I was getting the opposite. You know, and even though I know that people mean super well, most people mean very well, um, I still see it as something like slightly superficial mm. and I, I, I don't really attach it to, to who I am. Like beauty, you mean? Or, like beauty or, or, or status or, or accomplishment, um, like it's still it feels it still feels very external to me yeah uh it's not how should i put it um it feeds my faith in life but i try to make sure it doesn't feed my ego mm. you know um yeah and um the reason I feel like, the reason I wish that people knew that part of that a part of my past, that part of me, is because over time now, I I have a hard the one thing I have a hard time to cope with is um, 
is the opposite of being uh, bullied is being envied, which is something that I never expected, first of all, because like I said, like I don't see myself as this Ali or Alisa that everyone looks at, you know, like... Mm -hmm. I have I have a I have a full I have a full vision of 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 me since day one, um, but um, where is that going? Well, yeah, you're just doing like you, you know. Like, yeah. You know. I'm just I'm just I'm just trying you know like how should I put it? I um, I try to seize the day and seize every opportunity that's that's been given to me. I try to, I do my best. I try to be a good person. I think that's why, you know, like when you say like, you always know someone, this and that, is because I've always made it a point of being kind and nice. You have good vibes, yeah. Like yeah. there's, it's no surprise that somebody gave you a job instantly to take care of like these precious sensitive artists mm. in the <laughs> in the DJ world, you know, like and you're a good people's person. Like it yeah. stays with people. So but I also always admire that you like yeah, you have a vision and you do wanna you wanna get somewhere, you know, like you don't wanna just stay where you are. Mm. And I really admire that too. Like the whole like yeah. I I try to do the same thing, you know, like stuff comes on your path and then maybe it's not exactly what you need want to do like a marketing studies mm -hmm. or, or or a job at Bruce maybe that like that has stories that are a bit further mm -hmm. from you but in the end like there's always opportunities coming from these like exactly like one step another step and then three steps down the road you know like 50 more people that actually have like their own projects going on or like mm -hmm. their own dreams and like well, yeah, exactly. I feel like every experience, like, first of all, brings you experience, brings you something to learn, brings you people to meet, perspectives to hear. Um, and also, um, so before I got, while I was studying, before I got on my Erasmus, um, I was working a, a, um, as a receptionist in this headhunters company, like in the evening, it was really not much to do, just opening doors and re re oh, like distributing um, the mail. Mm. There was nothing to do. <laughs> so I spent a lot of hours watching TED Talks. Mm. A lot of them. Like I'm talking about hundreds of hours. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is because this conversation is reminding two very valuable things I've learned that I've always applied, which was um, the first one is every detour will end up being useful towards your end destination. Like there's actually, there, there's no such thing as a detour. Mm. You can, you might go where you want to go, not as fast as you want to be, to go there but you will probably arrive there with a lot more um, knowledge and skills mm. than if you had gotten everything you wanted straight away. Yeah. So that's worth something. And maybe you didn't even want to go there and like in the first place, you um, know, like sometimes you like a lot of the times I think you discover new directions. I, think, I never in, dreamed of uh, it. I never even dared yeah. to really think that any of this was possible you know i just showed up but then i was like well okay i'll do that that and also um every opportunity is the right person who knows that you can do the right thing that's really how simple it is it's the right person someone who's in charge of something or who knows someone who who knows someone that sees what you can do for some for something or for someone or for a project mm -hmm. and who will be like, ah. Oh, I think also I expressing yeah, is an important one uh, in there, like uh, expressing what you want, who you are, what you what you want to do, you know, like, yeah, that's, you want to uh, start a podcast, like that's start something saying, I've been learning. like that's start something I've telling been people that you're like, yeah, you're going to do this. And then like, yeah, definitely. And then, go yeah, for if it, the right you know? pe people, if the right people hear it like yeah. could you land you somewhere 
unexpected. Exactly. So and where so this uh, the connection with journalism that's like almost accidental or like or does it come from your YouTube say, binging in the uh, I would say Luxembourg? that um so I do have like dreams from back from from when I was a teenager. Um one one of which is writing a book. And I felt like journalism was uh, already one step closer to that. Um, especially for a company that I had binge watched documentaries about. I felt like it just made sense, you know. I mean, also as a, as a, as a, tr as a trained translator, when you study translation, you also study writing. Mm. You learn how to write stuff because... Obviously. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess the translation is also always an interpretation. On yeah, two, you never... No? Like, you can't... One it's on never one. literal. No, no. You always no. have to re, 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 re... You have to appropriate the text, yeah. make it your own, and um, write it as if it had been written in its original... Like, the, the language in, in which you are writing it has yeah. been written in, in, in this language originally. So, you you learn how to be a writer. It's a skill, you know, like... Maybe it's not as super creative um, or less creative than um, being the original author of a of a piece of work, but it definitely allows you to be to do that. Um, so so yeah, I um, I've done that. I think I've been I've done journalism properly for two years um but it was like a dream that you had as a little girl or did it like writing was a dream as a girl writing was a dream uh i that you... didn't necessarily think it would be journalism but also i feel like i've i've also always tried to keep an open mind towards the opportunities that are given to me and always try to look more at what am i going to learn from this Rather than what is it gonna make of me, if I can put it this way, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for me it's just very important to be able to to acquire skills. You know, like I feel like that's what my twenties were really about: is trying different things, getting to know different people, getting to know myself, um, acquiring different skills, and uh, figuring out a way to. Um, put all of these interests that I have together to be able to become the right person for something else, something bigger coming up one day, who knows? Um, but also without being, without sticking too hard to this one idea in my head, you know, like mm. I already, I've already, already always felt super blessed of the opportunities that were given to me, even though I had never, even though some of them I had never dreamt of, like I never saw myself. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't know, didn't know that being an artist manager or liaison or host for DJs at a club was a thing. Mm. I didn't know that was a job. That's a job. It's not a job, man. It is a job, but You know, it's, uh, it's a job you're good at too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm. Um, it's definitely taken me places, um, especially after everything with COVID stopped and we could just do festivals again properly like we used to. Uh, it really took off for me. Um, um, like all this artist care uh, took took off like took off on another level where before I was really attached to one specific place. Now um, I'm, I'm really, I'm freelancing for all of my favorite festivals. Mm. Um, yeah, you have a variation in your uh, exactly. work environment. I think I do like, I do more than 10 a year. Um, I have a lot of artists that I see several times a year that actually, a lot of them actually start telling me like, you're out every, <laughs> I'm like, 
Yeah, yeah so you. <laughs> uh, so that's actually really nice uh, because uh, the festival scene in Brussels is quite developed. And at the same time, you also bump into a lot of the same people systematically on different projects, mm. which really allows it to give you this feeling of uh, of true friendship, like beyond it being like people you meet at a festival, people you work with or Yeah, but the whatever. work and the people it's who more. work there, yeah, it's like, uh, it's a small world, right? Like it's, exactly, uh, exactly. It's like a lot of and, the same, uh, like not so many people involved in the top and definitely in like, High level kind of paradise city fuse, you know, yeah. like. Well, I I mean it makes sense, you know, because these are bigger organizations. There's not that much room for error, so obviously they want to work with people with experience or people that have been referenced to them by other people who have experience, people that they trust. It's because it's a lot about trust. Like the most yeah. important thing in the event sector is trust mm -hmm. well, and being trustworthy, Yeah, you know, like showing up on time. Photography, business, video, film business, same thing, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, uh, it takes, it takes you some time to build that trust to like, to show that you're not just like, you just decided to be a photographer, you know, mm -hmm. like portfolio and stuff, but yeah, it's very, very similar. Yeah. So, uh, and so, but, and, could you say now, do you like, do you have uh, role models or like people that you look up to or that are, or that you could say that are an example in like the stuff that you do, but like, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I would say I have quite a few. Um, when it comes to journalism uh, in writing, uh, I have huge admiration for my friend Bohana. He is based in Amsterdam. Uh, he... Um, is a pretty well-known journalist and writer. Um, he is originally from Egypt, uh, lived in Stockholm, um, and actually met him through Vice. He was actually in the Amsterdam office from Vice, and one day he just showed up in the Brussels office. And we just looked at each other, and we just knew. <laughs> it was very funny. Um, at some point, at, at the end of the day, like he sat next to me, working and then we just went out for drinks um, and we just we just had instant super deep conversations um and uh, yeah he's very he's uh, specialized in um, everything lgbtq but also he what i admire the most about him is that he's unafraid mm. of tackling difficult subjects um and making noise about something that he finds very important, regardless of whatever anyone else around him mm. says. Um, he's very, he's very talented. He has a sharp mind, sharp tongue. Like you do not fight with this guy. <laughs> like you are losing. You, know, you found your match. <laughs> <laughs> I found a master. Oh. Like I am impressed by this guy. I know not to mess with him. <laughs> really, 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 really. Um, then also, uh, maybe in video journalism, I have two. One is Johnny Harris. Um, he used to work at uh, Vox, which is a YouTube channel. Um, now he has his own. Um, he actually started off uh, in um, geography and world maps, mm. funny enough. And then he built it up to more political subjects and economics. And for me, he's a very great example of how um, precise, impartial and thorough independent journalism can be. It's very relevant as well. Like yeah. He has millions of followers and he's super well respected. And for me, it's um, proof that you can make it um, by yourself without necessarily the support of a big media outlet behind you. Like, obviously, it's, it's, it's good to learn your skills in these kinds of companies, definitely. Mm. But what if you have those skills, you can do it. Um, also, I would say, so for me, sorry, she, she's head of films for Resident Advisor. 
So she does, um, she works on a lot of their documentaries where they follow artists on tour Mm -hmm. or when they film workshops of um, how how artists play. Um, so or, resident advisor, you just explained to me before the show. Yes. I didn't know it, but like yes, yes, yes. very specific so, in electronic music. It's the most influential platform in electronic music in the world. Um, they've been there for like over 20 years. Um, they have uh, this incredible magazine, incredible YouTube channel. Um, if you need to know anything about an artist or a venue or a promoter or a festival it will probably be be on there okay um so yeah i love uh the way that they film the angles they take the narration like everything is just top notch um and then for events um actually as a stage manager yeah, is I that wouldn't like, uh, say I'm a role model. Like, could be very close again. You know, like. um, I would say I am, I am grateful for one person. Uh, her name is Sophie Vranks. Because it's through meeting her at Crossroads in 2018 or 19. Uh, that I actually discovered that you could actually be a stage manager as a freelancer and just send an invoice and, you know, you're hired by a bunch of different organizations to do that. Mm. Uh, I didn't know that was possible until I met her. Um, and she's also a stage manager? Or... Yes. Uh, it's funny because, like, we're on a lot of the same projects. Uh. Um, she's more of a main stage kind of girl. She lo- She's <laughs> like the, the big artist. Yeah, like labels for each other. Yeah. Yes, I'm definitely the like, house yeah. stage or like yeah, the... Like a boiler room kind of... Your boiler room kind of... Uh, I would say I'm way more like stage I'm fan. deeper in the left field or like the more underground or the, the more... How, how should I put it? The Definitely the very popular DJs, yes. But not necessarily those that are like mainstream yeah. like if i am asked to do main stage my answer is no oh. i don't want to because main stage always attracts a lot of entourage a lot of people who want to be there be seen mm. and no shade to anyone like live your events experience the way you want to but it's just not my vibe. Mm. Like, I mean, maybe it's because I started off in Berlin or in C12, where there is really all about the music. Right. Like anything else is really superficial and unnecessary and really just distracting. Mm. So I kind of uphold that way of looking at it. So for me, like... Even like being on a huge stage where you don't even barely see people's faces. I find it too much. Yeah, it's a difference. Like, I like it uh, when I have a smaller stage and I can just like go on the dance floor. A bit more intimate maybe. Very intimate. Um, You can look at like, sometimes I'll be on stage serving someone a drink or helping the sound technician like move something around and I will, you know, lock eyes with someone and we'll have a little moment, you know, and <laughs> I'll be like, Oh, I like your style. Or they'll be like, Oh, I like your vibe. Or we will be dancing or something. <laughs> or I'll see someone doing something nice to someone else. And I'll be like, Hey, take a beer, man. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like that's a nice experience to, ex- to exchange, even if it is, um, 20 seconds or a minute. Yeah. You know? It can make a big difference, I think. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, definitely. Um, also, also, yeah, I do have a lot of admiration for everyone I've worked with, whether it's Alex from Horst or Zoe from Paradise City or the girls from Narcha Techno um, or Tom, um, who does a bunch of different things in Ghent. Uh, all these people are all extremely humble, extremely hardworking, 
generous, um, down to earth, positive minded, relaxed, um, doing good job, doing their best. I I must say that I do feel very blessed to be allowed the the privilege of working so closely with so many incredible people. That's definitely that's definitely something else. Yes. Yeah, I I have one friend that's in, I think he's he's involved in a lot of stuff, uh, but I, I know Paradise City and like but he's been doing this for like 15 years, 20 mm. years now too, I think. As long as I've been in photography in Lennart. I know, Lennart yeah, Lappas, I'm going to ask. He, he was my neighbor. He lived, yeah. he, he grew up in the same street. Like yeah. I know his dad and stuff. So it's like, but he is the sweetest, one of the sweetest people I know, mm. you know, like such a, I don't know, but it's still a hard worker, a hustler mm -hmm. a bit, you know, like, but like good guy, you know, good vibes. Yeah. Like and I could see that ruling that good scene like the good scenes you know like exactly. it's always like it's not a generalization of course but like we said it's a small small world in the end you know like you don't have 50 people organizing big events here like uh, uh, or like like actually, that and that or more <laughs> or you do i think i think it, it must be around 50 but i don't think there's like 150 but like, but like yes. the core people in the end definitely you know, or like who, definitely. who ends up being in management of of uh, mm -hmm. artists and stuff you know like uh, yeah it's uh what i really like about it says a very especially in belgium like i like the culture um, people are, people really value kindness and doing your best and, you know, um, not stressing out about stuff, not blaming other people. We're all here in this together. And if there's an issue, we're here to find a solution. Mm, that's nice. Um, and also, also just this ability to believe in it, you know, like you have an idea and you share this idea with other people and we all believe in it and we're all, you know, going to come together and do play our part. Um, make it work. And make it work, you know, because there are huge risks uh, coming with organizing a festival. There are huge responsibilities, you know. What lots is, of money involved. Lots of oh. money, lots of security. Um, also, you know, people trust you with their time and they trust you... Uh, with giving them a nice experience and obviously I'm not responsible for the audience but I'm responsible for the person who's playing music for the audience and if they're having a shitty time then the audience is having a shitty time because an artist who is not in flow or in sync or just in a good vibration um, they're not going to be in it and if they're not in it how can it pull anyone else in it it's not happening you know so um so yeah, it's very, it's, it's, all of this is very subtle and every detail counts. And in the end, for me, I see it as pure magic. And I just, sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm tired when it's day four and it's this four day that you sleep for only three hours. And it's your fourth day of standing on your feet for 15 hours and... You always have someone who's like a bit too drunk and who's trying to get in somewhere where they're not supposed to. I was going to gonna say that. Nah, like, nah. it's also in an environment where there's like, yeah, drunk people, people are like letting go of their, yes, of their stress and their, it's their time yes. to like, to relax and to breathe. But like, then also some people have a hard time, like. You have keeping to, it within you the, have to treat them like children that's my approach it's like, uh, yeah. it's like it's just, i just look at you like a child right now i'm like darling i understand yeah. you just want to have a good time but it's fine but look you can have it over there just go over there you know it's fine you know and i think it's important also to to keep this approach like obviously there are times where i couldn't i'm just too tired i'm too i'm too hungry or some manager or someone, you know, was really annoying, very negative, and I just mm. did not have the the strength to keep up my walls and protect myself and like absorb that moment. Mm. 
Um, and then I, I need some time to like, let it go, let yeah. it go, come back to love, you know? And obviously, yes, if you're, if you are not in a good moment, whatever your message is, is if the person in front of you is not, is yeah. not having it, <laughs> then it just can just escalate, you know? And then you have to, oh, I have yeah. to escalate. But it's all, it is all about vibrations, I think. You know, definitely, I do believe that, like... Definitely, like, like, I joke around a lot, you know, um, like, I never have problems because I make sure that I'm in the right state of mind and the right energy and the right frequency. Mm. And then it's contagious. Yeah. yeah. It's contagious. But, well, yeah, but when a crowd like that, too, when the when a DJ or a performer can get that crowd... Exactly. To get it, be all excited at the same yeah. time, is it's like... You can just feel it in the air, you know. Exactly, it's like electricity. and that's what it's <laughs> really all about, that. you know. And and I feel like that's I feel like that's my favorite part of it. Okay. So that's my favorite part of it, and, uh, and sometimes I'm whining and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna quit, and then I'm. Yeah, well, I'll do it again. I'll, I'll keep doing it again because I still love it, you know. Because how is it living? Because this is your job, right? Like this is yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's one of my jobs. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. That's um, what I was gonna ask. Like, is this something that you could do? Uh, like that you live from from doing just this, or or do you have to combine a couple of the things that we said? Or I like... think I think it would be possible to live off of it if I would be willing to also do a lot of stuff I don't want to do, and if I was willing to go travel to places I don't want to travel to mm. and live a more than humble life. Yes. But um, I do like a little comfort. So I've always combined it with something else, whether that is working as a casting agent or a PR agent. Um, I've always done lots of different things um during the week also you've been organizing events too i've right? also like... been organizing my own events yeah that's also that's a lot it's amazing yeah, yeah. uh i love it um but you like the variation also like... yes um i think i'm the kind of person who cannot do one task or cannot do the same thing every day i like the versatility um, I like like organizing events. I love scouting for a location. I love ma making a deal with uh, with the people I'm gonna work with. I love going to taste for the different drinks we're gonna serve. Um, I love um, think about scenography. Where should we put the lights? Okay, how should we build up this lineup? Or what's the timetable gonna be? Uh, where do we put the entrance? How are we going to greet people? How are we going to communicate online? What is our tone of voice? What are the pictures we're going to share? What are we not going to share? Like, I'm very, and that's probably uh, has to do with my, with my upbringing, but I've always been very secretive. Like, if someone doesn't ask me what I do, I'm not going to tell them. Mm. Or if they do ask me, I will always be a bit vague as well um and that's kind of the same approach i had with my parties which was like quite secretive like the the instagram pa page is uh is private um if you wanted to participate you had to like fill in this form let us know who you through who you heard about us mm. what kind of person you are you know a bit more exclusive also like, or like yeah. i think it's not to exclude, but like, you know. I wouldn't call it exclusive, but I would definitely call it private mm. as in, um, protected, mm. protective. I would call it protective because it's not because I didn't know you that you were not let, being let in. No, it was more about like safe space. Also, maybe? also like, yeah, yeah. It's definitely like keeping the, the, the because in a party of 100 people or 150 people, if you have 30 negative people, it's very easy for these people to kill the vibe, mm. you know? Yeah. It's not like if you have 30 people 
drowned into 3,000 loving, joyful people, mm-hmm. you know? And so I feel like um, since I like intimate parties, my favorite parties are like 200, 300 people max. Mm. Really. Like if I have to be in a crowd of 10,000 people, I get a bit anxious. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. It's like, that's like a different business too, I think. Like, exactly. You know, like you know? That scale. And so that's why I figured if I'm doing 100 people, 150, I really want to make sure that everyone is a little, you know, diamond of joy. Mm. You know, and I and I, I really believe that birds of the same feather flock together. So that's also why I wanted to know who told you about it and who do you have you told about it? Because then, even though I don't know you, um, if I trust the person that has invited you, I think I, I think I can trust you as yeah. well. You know, like I remember my first party. I these two guys I'd never seen before. They looked a bit weird. And I was like, who are you, you know? And I was a bit protective. And so I was asking a bit more questions. And I was like, so where's your where's your form that you filled in, you know? And they, uh, they showed me. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I accepted you. Uh, but, I mean, you're here now. <laughs> and so I went through the form. And I said, oh, who told you about this party? Barbara. Which is one of my best friends. Uh, okay. And she's super open minded. Like she's a she's a philosopher, like innovation person. Like she's so open minded. And I looked at her and I said, Look, if Barbara vouched for you, okay. <laughs> welcome. This is what we do. This is what this is a space of I remember I t- I told him like this is a space of love uh, and benevolence and where I Expect everyone to be responsible for the energy that they bring into the room, and I'm, and I'm giving you a chance to show up as your best self, and to make the best out of it. And it was funny because like the whole time these guys were like a bit tense, a bit like worried, a bit hostile because like they're taking a taxi and paid probably thirty euros to be here. Mm. Like if I was going to reject them, <laughs> would have, would have been really annoying, you know and. The moment I said, okay, like they really just relaxed and I saw a different version of them yeah. and uh, I saw them again later and we had a good time, you know, and so yeah, it's definitely not exclusive, but protective and exclusive trying to set the round well. tone, you know, really. Um, so yeah, I did that for a long time as well. Like I said earlier, I really try to do a bunch of different things and see where it takes me. Okay. Okay. And are there things that you're working on right now? Like, what are you, where, where are you? Um, Obviously, well, or is this are there anything you can share also? Like, well, <laughs> I have to say that I am working on quite a few things that are quite awesome. Quite <laughs> awesome. But I can't jinx them just yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe by the time this episode will be online. I'll be able to to let you know and you can like add it somewhere. We'll put all the links. Uh, uh, but I'm definitely uh, I work at Fuse and okay. in the artist care team. Okay. I work uh, for different festivals like Paradise City, Listen Festival. I'm going to go to um, Amsterdam, um, work more closely with a friend of mine who does exactly the same things as I do, but over there. So I was on a different scale as well. Um, because I want to train other stage managers, um, because I feel like there's kind it started, they're starting to get a lack of people who do this the right way. I cannot be everywhere either. And, uh, where I think, can you learn this? Yeah. Except for the, I the think, actual stage, the actual club, like where can you, I think learn? it's really, I think it's mainly about, a how should I put it? I think it's a mindset. I think there's a certain psychology to being a host. Yeah, but like to 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 start to go to a club and say, "Hey, I want to do this." Like, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> no, right? Like, uh, 
I, I mean, I could. You just but got promoted not really. into it, you know? Like, exactly. By yes. Somebody who saw this in exactly. you, I guess. But like, but that's there's really... no school. There's no yeah. trainings or. Uh, but that's like... typical. The creative industries is quite gate. Like there's, it's not really gate kept. You know, it's not like it's a hard no, but it will definitely be easier if someone vouched for you. That's for sure. Yeah. That makes it way easier. Um, and, um, and yeah, I'm, uh, I'm more than glad to help others get a chance at trying this out. Um, and also guiding them into, you know, like how to strip off of your insecurities, how to approach someone without ego, being open-minded not make it about you, make it about them, mm. um, what questions to ask. Like my two first questions are always, how do you feel and what do you want to drink? Mm. <laughs> Simple, well, nice, you know, nice Simple. Uh, and you know, like make easy conversation with someone, like be interested in them as a person opposed to as an artist. You Don't know? ask selfies. Don't ask selfies, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and also, you know, um, little things, little things like introduce yourself. If you see someone is having a hard time, I don't know, like your son engineer is just in a bad mood because he just had to fix this other thing. Like just bring this guy a beer, you know, mm. and be uh, just For spread the love. love, spread the love, stuff like that. You know, it's very, it, it sounds wishy-washy hippie hippie no. lovey dovey like but it really makes a difference um so yeah so i do that um i also um so since i've been studying but i also work uh in events i happen to have taken a lot of time on my master's mm. right, since okay, okay. exams are always uh at peak time of festival season uh, so i've taken a lot of time um, and so I'm rounding up my thesis, uh, okay. which, which is on, um, which is actually on a content aggregation platform about, um, that is about, um, anything creative, whether that be music or food or, um, any sort of art. Um, that's in your marketing studies. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. in my marketing studies. So I'm rounding that okay. up and hopefully, uh, while I'm in Amsterdam, I will also, meet the right people for that um that'll be nice this is more of a long-term project like i wouldn't say this is gonna come out like tomorrow but um it's definitely something i want to do in the long run hopefully something i will be doing uh once i'll be too old for events um and uh and i'm working on my father's memoirs Ooh. because i never knew him Okay. Uh, so I've been having conversations with my uncles and old friends of his and other journalists who actually knew him. And he was a journalist? Um, no. no, he was actually a pretty prominent figure in business and politics in Ivory Coast. Okay. Um, and he had to go back there when I was four. And I grew up without him. Um, and now I feel ready to dive deeper into his story because somehow his story is also mine and um and yeah i feel like that's the book i'm gonna write that i always wanted Ooh. to write wow yeah and uh wow that's super interesting so then you're talking to people at, in ivory coast now yes exactly oh wow exactly and uh it took me a long time to be ready to do it but now i am and uh and yeah, I would love to get a little writing residency at some at some time to run it up. And um and yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's like Yeah, I'm glad really interesting. Yeah, I'm glad such um such a project. I've uh, I had putting writing a little bit on the side because I was always writing about events and music and as much as I love it, I wanted to go deeper, which through the media outlets I was writing for, it wasn't really possible. Um, and, uh, and yeah, 
these are all the different things I'm working on. Really living the creative life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but it's really nice. It's a very big variation and definitely like the whole book. Like yeah, I'm getting there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally. Yeah. And also, you have time. You know, like there's no there's uh, like, no rush. No. Uh, yeah. There's no deadline. Uh, I mean, no one is now. waiting for it. No, no, you exactly, know, that's no. the that's that's the nice part. Um, I'm really, I'm really using every single experience I've had or I'm having, as um, as input for uh, the things I want to do. So, uh, so yeah. Okay, and do you have any links with Ivory Coast, to, like be outside of the? Like for the book now that you're having, did you have, do you have family there then that you know, or, or are you now starting, or you're starting to know them now, or did you already I mean, like... I knew them because I've been five years ago. Okay. Uh, but I was never really close to them. Oh. But the nice part about, the nice part about an African family is that it doesn't matter how many years they haven't, you haven't spoken to them. Mm. Like, you can call them tomorrow and it will be as if you had been calling them every day. Oh, that's nice. So that's very nice. Um, and, um, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I'm curious. I want to read that book. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. But you have time, yeah. I still I have, have a bunch have of time. other books to, to yeah. read. <laughs> I'm a very bad reader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you can't finish a book. But it's, uh, it's, it's not always easy, you know, to be on like a lot of different things at the same time, because obviously you can either do one thing and give it a hundred percent, or you can do five things and all give them 20%. Um, could you, could you do no. just one thing? I couldn't either, you know, like it's I'm not a bit the I same function. way and like it's, I do so many things at the same time and then sometimes I don't finish. Mm -hmm. projects or I haven't finished projects that I started like years ago you know mm -hmm. like but then I also think you know like just like a little step at a time and then and yeah. then when it's ready it's ready and like exactly and I mean like it's okay for things to take time like my parties like I had been thinking about them for two years before I did that mm -hmm. uh this uh this uh this thing I'm doing for my thesis I've been th thinking about it for 10 years um this book also for over five years i've been thinking about this like it's uh it's really about uh, how should i put it uh following your path and when it's right it's right and then you just go for it and it doesn't matter when it, what what age you are it doesn't matter if you're getting your degree at 30 it doesn't matter if you write your for, first book at 50 None of it really matters in the sense that you have your own timeline and you don't have to abide to anyone else's timeline. And just do you, really. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's it for my questions, I think. Uh, my last question is, what's your message to the listener? <laughs> do you have any... Anything we don't talk about enough or uh, something you want to say? Uh, it's a bit cheesy, I know. Um, like... I would say <laughs> dare to believe in something greater than yourself. And if something greater than yourself offers you a chance to participate, go for it. And be... 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 Try, try to... Try to... To stick to the love as much as possible there you will always have fears cast them aside or deal with them whatever you do just but just don't let them take over mm. and love what you do and love the people around you love yourself that's the hardest one for me <laughs> um and um and yeah believe in it just go for it and don't self sabotage yourself. Just just do your best. Do your best and if someone is doing something good, tell them. And if you have something nice to say about someone else, say it. To them or to someone else. And uh we can all contribute to this virtue of positivity. 
Yeah, like the expression of and compliments and stuff. You yeah, know? like the spread you it should out. do it more. The spread out the love. Mm-hmm. Spread out the love and um, and remember that. I mean, life like life is serious, but doesn't have to only be serious. No. And I think it's I think it's worth it to. It's worth trying. It's worth trying, and even if you fail, then you you will have learned something, and and learning is growing. And the race is long. The race is long. <laughs> and wear and sunscreen. It's not really, <laughs> wear sunscreen. <laughs> and it's also not actually a race, right? Like, but it's a marathon. It's yeah, a yeah, marathon. right. Like it's yeah. the long in the long run, the long run that counts, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, and every decision can be corrected by another decision. Really, mm. and. Uh, and there's no such thing as perfection. And go for real. And people love real. Just dare to be real. You're just like shooting. I'm just keep going. I can keep yeah. going. I can go another hour. Darling. I can go another <laughs> hour. Turn your pain That's into great. prosperity. <laughs> you know, it's not Live. about what happens to you. It's about what you're going to do about it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a big truth in all of this. And where do you see yourself in, maybe that's like another cheesy question a little bit, but where do you see yourself in 10, 10 years? 10 years. 20 years. The alley okay. from right now. 20 years, I see myself not working. <laughs> I see myself uh, writing for fun, mm -hmm. writing maybe so, the kind of stuff, about the kind of stuff I just like spit out. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that we'll have launched... Um, a company, maybe that platform, that platform that will have helped people find inspiration and courage and joy, um, you know, inspiring people to go for their dreams and dare to, how should I put it? Maybe not there, but try to integrate as much creativity in their lives as much as possible. Um, see the value in culture and humanities. And uh, maybe have one of my books turned into a movie. That would be nice. Mm. That'd be nice. That'd would be you cool. direct it? I'd love to. Yeah. Yes. I'll probably be too old to play in it, but direct it. <laughs> yes. That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah. Would you be like? Would you want to act? Like, I, would you be? I, an actor? I, 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 I would love to act. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Okay. M more of an, an action or in a comedy thing than anything else, really. Uh, yeah. I don't really see myself like do some like a thriller or, or maybe maybe I would. What am I saying? No, no, but yeah, just the just fact act. that you want to be an actor be nice. or that you would like consider it as like I don't think that uh, like not everybody wants to do yeah. that, right? Like we we're all like admiring famous actors, but not everybody. Like I don't I don't necessarily want to be an actor. I think. You know, like, I mean, I would love to. Like I've thought about it. Play in like, a movie. Or, but, but without necessarily being famous. That's mm. the thing, though. Like, I want to do things that are creative, but that mm. unfortunately make you famous without me actually really want to be mm. famous. Like, I don't mind being a little known, but famous... Mm. It comes with a, with a price. Like, don't... If I'm, if I'm, like, in a supermarket, in yeah. my sweatshirts, my hair not done, my makeup not done, I don't want to feel worried about someone like trying to take a picture of me you know like just let me be a human mm. as well you know um and yeah have a beautiful group of friends maybe a family have huge dinners at home mm. spend half of my day cooking mm. yeah, oh, yeah playing a lot of good music too. that'd be nice maybe have a a, a a house for artists you know where people can come practice creativity or artists can can come stay over uh, mm. for the weekend while they have a gig or something. I still want to do lots of stuff. Yeah. Oh. Will all of it still fit in into the 50, 60 years left? We'll see. Yeah. In the end, you have a big catalog of things that you want to do. And then yeah. you have your vision, which yeah. is kind of holds all of those together and then you can see what what people need yeah or what's like where the need is and then mm -hmm. yeah i, I believe 
I believe in you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I um. Yeah, I have nothing to add to this. Nothing Thank to you add very to much this. for believing no, in me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much for coming and uh, coming over, talking, sharing thank your you. your story. Yes, so. it was the first time I did this, and uh, it was very it was nice. Thank you very much for this experience. Oh, well, you're welcome. It's uh, I really like doing it. I want to say also like the. <laughs> The reason I started this is because I I just really feel like I I know so many interesting people like you mm -hmm. like with their own story but like you never get to sit down and then say like all right like now explain like please tell me from mm -hmm. from somewhat the beginning like how mm -hmm. did this and it's really interesting to like also to hear how you grew up and stuff like yeah. a little bit you know like so uh, it helps fill in some details sometimes yeah. and like well, explain why you're like where you are a wonderful person i think and like so ambitious you know because mm. uh yeah, yeah luxembourg context. it's not brussels luxembourg Provence, like, Pro Provence, Provence Luxembourg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which i remember from like doing some real estate photography there yeah. sometimes it's i think it's like very much focused on luxembourg which is pretty close yeah, right yeah, yeah, like yeah. and that's like a its own country basically you know, yes like, exactly so. i was not on the right side of the border mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah beautiful nature though right yeah beautiful <laughs> amazing great <laughs> love it but you didn't you didn't turn out to be a landscape uh painter or photographer i so. ran away as fast <laughs> as i could darling <laughs> but yeah more okay. than another time maybe yeah, yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> all right thank you thank very you. much clap